why don't we talk about, if you will, the classic patients? I mean, putting aside those patients with normal ejection fraction. Yeah. The patients who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, not being a cardiologist, uh, I wasn't aware that you guys call this HEFREF. We do. Heart failure, reduced ejection fraction. I like HEFREF. Yeah. It's easier to say. But um, what proportion of heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction, what proportion of that is that of the entire heart failure population? It's about 50%. So it's a it, lot. You know, it depends on which uh, survey you look at. But overall, we consider heart failure with reduced ejection fraction an ejection fraction that is um, less than or equal to 40%. So 40% is your, your 40% heart. is our cutoff. Okay. Above that, we call it either heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now the Europeans have made a new category. They're calling it heart failure with mid-range ejection <laughs> fraction. And that's really just to confuse us all. But um, we've traditionally called anything below 40 or 40 and below HEF-REF and anything above 40 HEF-PEF. Heart <laughs> failure with preserved ejection, ejection fraction. fraction. Just I to save that. words. Just to save words. The okay. main distinction, though, is it, because these are arbitrary cutoffs, uh, the main distinction is that uh, there is no evidence based therapy that has yet been proven to work in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, whereas we have a whole armamentarium of therapies in patients okay. with heart failure and reduced ejection. So it's going to be fruitful to drill down on these HEF REF. Patients, yes. reduced ejection fraction patients. So let's establish again, right at the outset, who are we talking about? What are the characteristic patients with HEFREF? They're um, patients that have multiple comorbid conditions. So they're patients, up to two thirds of them will have coronary heart disease. Um, a lot of them, up to 40%, may have diabetes uh, or atrial fibrillation. Uh, they, many of them have long standing hypertension. So they have risk factors and concomitant diseases that go along with heart failure and may increase the risk of getting heart failure. So these are kind of the classic patients, right? The patients with peripheral vascular disease, other evidence for vascular injury going forward. These are the ones you look at the Netter diagram about when you yeah. were in medical school. The, the important um, thing to remember about HEF-REF is that these are patients who have an abnormality of cardiac contraction for a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have it because they had heart attacks. Some of them have long-standing hypertension. Some of them have genetic cardiomyopathies. Some of them have a left bundle branch block, which leads to an electrical dyssynchrony that can make their heart worse. But at the end of the day, their heart doesn't pump as well as it should. And that's really the primary problem. And it causes a lot of other things to happen, like a um, uh, neurohormonal cascade that um, uh, is secondary to that. But the primary problem is the, is the lack of contractile function. And I think that, that in that way, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is kind of the final common pathway for a lot of different illnesses, right? Okay. So that over time, uh, Dave, Don Lloyd Jones and others have, uh, have, have made this point that the lifetime risk of developing heart failure is about 20% for most people, independent of the age at which you start. And, uh, and it's largely because if you're lucky enough to survive your heart attack, then down the road, you might develop heart failure. Okay, but again, I didn't miss that in the middle of your sentence. You were, if, if you're lucky enough to survive your heart attack. So post-MI is one, it was one, category. one category of folks yeah. who, who have a problem with this. You don't need an MI to have this. No, 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 no. I think Scott listed a number of different things right. uh, yeah. that are there. Hypertension is a, is a big driver, and I think, as Orly pointed out, uh, control of blood pressure is a, is a critical feature of trying to prevent heart failure mm -hmm. development. What do these folks look like when they come into your office? I mean, I, I, in medical school, I was taught heart failure, you squish when you walk, and you pant, and you don't breathe very well. What do you look like? What do these HEFREF folks look like? Well, if you think about what is heart failure, I mean, I, I like a, a definition that um, uh, says that heart failure is the inability uh, of the heart to provide enough cardiac output to the body or to do so only at the expense of elevated filling pressures. Now, what does that mean? Elevated filling pressures means that um, you have congestion. If the left side of the heart can't function as well as it should, that blood is gonna back up into the lungs and then it's gonna keep backing up into the periphery as well. And so congestion mm -hmm. is uh, one of the primary things that we see in these patients, that is they have 
um, shortness of breath. They can even have pulmonary edema, of course. They can have right-sided edema, including swollen ankles, early satiety, and so forth. Their neck veins are elevated. Um, in addition, if they're not providing enough cardiac output, they can be tired. Mm -hmm. um, they can um, not be able to do the things that they want to do. And you have to be able to ask the patients, what can you really do? Um, if you say, how do you feel, they may say, fine. But if you say, can you, can you make your bed? No, I can't do that without feeling okay. short of breath.